It is now time for the TC39 panel. So you'll see some familiar faces. Uh, we have Urjwal, uh, we have Shane, we have Dan, and also coming up on stage right now, uh, we have Michael. Uh, Michael is a distinguished engineer at Shape Security, uh, which is part of F5, um, and he's been uh, working on uh, TC39 for, for a long time now. Um, so I'll be asking the, the questions today. And uh, um, so I think we've kind of, we've heard a lot about how the committee works. I hope everyone has the link to the Slido because that's where I'll be sourcing uh, questions from. So I've got that up here. Um, and I can see you're already voting on these questions, which is good. Um, I guess, uh, first of all, we'll just, just start off so you, so you can lead, lead in. Which proposals that are currently active in committee uh, are you most excited about? Well, uh, aside from signals, I'm very excited about the pattern matching proposal. Pattern matching will bring the ability of JavaScript to destructure data structures and uh, it's, it's a common feature in functional programming that, that just makes a lot of normal, everyday data structure manipulation cleaner and, and simpler. Um, yeah, I'd say I'm very excited about the temporal proposal. This is bringing a new daytime API into the ECMAScript ecosystem. I've worked extensively as a champion on this proposal uh, to make it very insole friendly, ITN friendly. Um, and uh, I think it's really going to solve a huge gap uh, that we currently have in, in ECMAScript by bringing you know, a really good, solid uh, daytime handling library. Yeah, I'm personally very excited about message format. It's a new, relatively uh, effort in that it has only been, what, five years <laughs> in the making? Uh, no, but more seriously, it is in many ways the final boss of, of internationalization proposals. We've spent many years building the building blocks, and it's a full-blown internationalization system, and I'm very happy that we're standardizing it. Uh, for me, if, if I'm allowed to say my own proposals, then uh, it would be iterator helpers, uh, the, the, a bunch of methods added to iterator.prototype, but if, 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 I, if I don't, I would say it's probably base64 encoding and decoding. Very excited about that. Feel free to whoop and cheer when you hear your favorite proposals. <laughs> I cannot guarantee it will help them advance, but it cannot hurt. It, you can also boo if you hear a proposal that you don't like. We, we do like feedback, yes. Um, all right, uh, so just going to the, the crowdsource questions. So, um, Shane, I think this might be going to you, um, or at least, uh, or I think, uh, which is that people are asking, temporal, you know, uh, people have, have waited for this uh, for a long time. Uh, it's been you know, stuck at stage three for, for, for years and years, and it's still not standardized. Isn't it about time? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, really uh, excited to you know, um, see temporal lands, as I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, th there's been a lot of progress, actually, just in the last several months. Um, as the champions group, you know, we've gotten feedback from browsers that, um, that, that the requirements that, that we as the champions uh, gave in the proposal that reached stage three were just um, uh, were very difficult for them to implement. So what we just did um, just this last week was, was put forward some changes to the temporal proposal to, to uh, simplify the API. We, we simplified it by about 20%. Uh, we still have just about all the functionality that we had before, but we uh, made some changes that make it much easier for browsers to implement. Um, I know that Jason in, in the audience has also been very active in, in um, in, in this effort, as well as uh, getting some C, some implementations in Rust and C++. I had talked earlier about how IC4X is a really good um, polyfill for Intel proposals. Um, we also are working on one that will work for temporal as well. Uh, this will allow browsers to more easily link a pre-existing native library into the browsers that we can also maybe even use as a polyfill as well. Um, so once all these pieces are put together, you know, I think that, you know, you're going to start seeing this, this, this shipping because we're definitely, you know, very actively working on, you know, how can we, you know, um, make it more feasible for browsers to land. So that's, that's the status that we're in at stage three. Great. Anything more to add on temporal? Well, uh, I think uh, one of the important things when it comes to temporal is to just think about the kind of progress we had made. Uh, I mean, temporal started very, very simple, but powerful idea of like fixing date 
I think we've gone well beyond that, where we are doing some things that are truly unique in that we had to go back and fix the timestamp format. Among other things, I think the fact that Temporal allows you to use any non-Gregorian calendar, most of the CLDR supported calendars, I think that's pretty powerful. And uh, it's taking a while because it's one of the most complex things we've done in a long time. Yeah, I think in, in uh, lines of spec text, uh, temporal is similar in size to all of ES6. Uh, so it's a, a big, big deal. Okay, um, th thank you. Um, all right, so on to spicy questions. What features or designs does uh, TC39 regret? Which I guess we're asking individually because uh, these are individual opinions. Uh, who would like to go first? Michael? Well, I can start with like the easy answer there, uh, which is that the committee has actually been recently reaching agreement a number of times on um, some, some API design um, uh, uh, design decisions that, that we've been um, consistent about in the past but are, are now breaking with. Uh, in particular, you know, we, we don't want um, some implicit conversions to be happening when you you pass in un uh, values of unexpected types into built-in APIs. So, um, yeah, we, we've we've now started a document on our normative conventions, which you can look at. Again, all of our work is is in the open, so you can you can go look at that on on our GitHub. And um, yeah, yeah, we're we're starting to make a break from those those. Um, patterns that were you know, problematic that we were following only for consistency purposes, but really we're hurting the community more than helping. Right. Um, I agree. I think all of the type coercion stuff is useful for a certain uh, scale of applications, but uh, for most practical JavaScript code bases, it just gets very confusing. I, I think uh, the way we're designing APIs these days makes it uh, sort of cleaner and, and easier to reason about. Um, one thing that continues to annoy me is how the uh, date.parse is just a complete, uh, it's completely seems random how it works in different browsers. It's not really a very consistent way. I think that temporal is going to move us uh, very much in the right direction here. But yeah, the fact that like basically date.parse in every browser works completely differently is, 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 is definitely a, a, a pain point that I wish we could clean up. Uh, so aside from the, the type coercions, for example, uh, any JavaScript value uh, like undefined becoming nan when you try to use it in arithmetic rather than throwing an exception, I would say one, one thing I don't like so much was added in ES6, which was symbol species. Uh, Many of the array methods were retrofitted with this capability to uh, produce other sorts of types that are not arrays in a way that's very complicated to implement. And, and I think one of the things that we've decided more recently is that new features going forward won't have symbol species. So we're able to reverse these decisions only partially because we can only do so with respect to new features usually due to our need to maintain compatibility with the web, which we call web compatibility. We can break some things sometimes as long as the web, whatever that means, doesn't depend on it too much. But usually that means just keeping existing things the same. I have one more, uh, well, I have many more, but, but I have one more I do really want to mention, which is uh, another one that we've actually recently kind of come to consensus on within committee, uh, which is the default iterability of strings. This, uh, this causes so many problems and really was, was a, a bad idea from the get-go. As Shane saw with, with Segmenter, there's, there's many different ways you could like split up strings and iterate over parts of it. Uh, and we just chose one code points as the default and um, you know, oftentimes that's not what you want. So we really wish we could undo that one. So, uh, so we've heard there is still some hope, some hope so long as we don't break the web. That, that's the, the slogan. All right. Um, next up. Um, well, this is a related topic. Um, since JavaScript has to stay backwards compatible, compatible, is there a chance of a new web language being created from the standards instead of fixing JavaScript? Uh, I don't think that will happen anytime soon. 
uh, you know, you can't never say never, but uh, there was this hope that Dart would become that future web language, and before that, the you know VB VB scripts supported on the web in Internet Explorer, even though it was dominant uh, at the time, it did not catch on. I think JavaScript is, uh, I think it's a good programming language, or definitely at least good enough. So for another language to catch on, it would have to um, solve some problem that JavaScript doesn't solve well enough. So it's hard for me to see why that would happen. One. One thing I'll, I'll uh, add there is, you know, we have WebAssembly, as I was just showing, which basically allows any programming language to be deployed on the web. Um, so I think that, you know, this is this is an approach that a lot of the of the engines have sort of settled on as like how we can get more languages to be able to be deployed here. Um, in terms of like the, the the native scripting language, I think JavaScript, you know, has really shown, you know, over the last you know a couple decades that you know it it's 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 a really solid language that you know it has its flaws, but like it gets the job done. And I think that WebAssembly is is sort of the alternative um, that allows you to basically deploy anything you want on the web platform. Yeah, I, I think that this possibility is very remote and, and getting more every day. I think JavaScript developers have more or less accepted the fact that despite writing JavaScript, the JavaScript they run is maybe not the JavaScript they're writing. And I think this makes us, uh, you know, not care as much about replacing JavaScript. We can always write uh, on top of it and it's, it's a solid language uh, for the web and the ecosystem benefits are just so strong that why would you switch to something from scratch? All right, thank you. I wanna mention that this wasn't inevitable that JavaScript remain uh, such a strong language. It's the, the combination of DC39 beginning to advance again with ES6 and, and later editions as well as TypeScript which make JavaScript a, a vibrant enough language that the um, sort of competitors in this space, like CoffeeScript, have, have somewhat fallen away over time. And so we, we have to keep up progress in order to maintain the relevance of JavaScript. Also, when, when Ujwal talks about ecosystem, I think there, there's just a lot of benefits to many people using the same programming language. There's a lot of cost to introducing another language. Thank you. So, uh, Shane, I think you've been doing a good selling job in your talk because we've got a, a specific question already of, should I use ICU4X to do my React application translations? That's a good question. Um, so, uh, we've, um, so I'll, I'll take a step back first and say that in the uh, TC39 TG2, um, which is the standards body that we have, we, you know, try to, you know, attract, um, uh, uh, stakeholders from many different platforms, um, and we've we've had uh, some people from from React as well as many other web frameworks join our calls. Um, I'll also use this as an opportunity to extend the invitation. One um, one type of stakeholder that we don't have enough of in our TG2 conversations are actual users, like like all of you. Um, so th this is an open invitation if you want to get more involved. Um, all you have to do is go to the ECMA 402 uh, GitHub page, and there's and there's instructions on how you can personally get more involved here. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, working with um, with with the different uh, web frameworks, you know, has definitely been a focus for our work in, in ECMA 402. Um, and you know, given that ICFRX is is uh, you know targets on um, uh, building a compatible API with ECMA 402, that means that does mean that it's it's a very natural choice. Um, I know that there's also you know. Um, other approaches, JavaScript only approaches that could work. Um, so, you know, but definitely IC for X is, is, is a very viable option, especially if you need to do some of the things that, that I was showing on, on, on the slides. Um, if you're interested in translating a React app, I'm assuming that means localizing it into various uh, locales, I, I would suggest you to explore message format instead as well. Uh, message format is a relatively new feature uh, in, I, I think it's being worked on right mm -hmm. now in ICU4X, uh, but we have a JavaScript polyfill for it ready and we are working on different popular translation libraries like the one that you might be using at the moment to add support for it, uh, but it's a higher level of abstraction that would allow you to, to uh, you know, have this format 
and the underlying tool might be ICU4X or some JavaScript library. One other thing I'll just add there is um, if you are looking at using ICU4X like at, in, in your projects or at your company, like, you know, um, we're, we're very open and hopefully friendly. Like, just please contact, contact anyone from the ICU4X team and, you know, we always love to learn more about how people are using this library in the wild. Uh, I, I also wanted to mention that uh, ICU4X is maybe the best for, for advanced cases, but for a lot of well-established APIs, we have the Intel library that's built into JavaScript that you can use without installing anything, without, uh, you know, with an even smaller download size. So if that meets your needs, then it's probably best to, to start with the, the platform solution and then expand to additional libraries where needed. Also, consider ecosystem libraries like Format.js, which build off of these into libraries and provide a, a higher level interface. Thank you. So uh, we're back to a spicy question. Do you have to manage pressure from commercial interests, e.g. Google V8, Apple with JSC? And how do you do that in the standards process? Who would like to take that one? I can say a little bit, I guess, which is that, um, you know, I, I sort of, you know, um, like, I work at this company called Google, but I'm also not on the V8 team. I'm on the internationalization team. So, um, like, you know, a lot of the times, like, you know, the things that I'm trying to get out of proposals, making them better for, for global multilingual users are not necessarily the things, like, you know, like even at V8 that, you know, V8 is looking for things that are small and efficient and things like that. So. Um, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, trade trade-offs that go into any of these proposals. I think we see with, with ECMAScript, uh, or sorry, with, uh, with Temporal and ECMAScript, with ECMAScript Temporal, um, we've seen how, like, you know, the, the ideal way that we would like to do daytime formatting ended up being sort of challenging for browsers to implement. Um, and I think that sort of drove, uh, you know, it's a lot of these changes that we just saw uh, this week. Um, so, I, but I do think that all the browsers are very cooperative. Um, with 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 this with the body um, are very active in TC39, um, and you know understand that you know there's not a single stakeholder who really gets to make these decisions. I'll, I'll just add that um, you know it, it is an inherently difficult problem because everybody has different motivation, um, but our process has been developed over you know the course of many years to you know tackle this specific problem, um, and you know it allows us to iteratively approach uh, you know, a solution that is agreeable to everyone involved. Right. I'd also add our, our process is very conservative in particular because we need consensus to add things to JavaScript as Ujwal explained and because changes need to be web compatible there's, there's quite a high bar to changing JavaScript and this means that the, the only way that you can work on a committee is to be, is to be a, a rigorous technical professional. So this is kind of common across standards in general that although people come from different organizations, you, you, it's not like you forget who they work for, but you try to leave it aside and try to focus on the common technical project. And I think we do a pretty good job of that in TC39. Yeah, the benefits of consensus. Uh, you cannot whip the vote when there is no vote. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up. Um, why do you keep calling JavaScript ECMAScript? What's the deal with that? Uh, there may or may not be a trademark for JavaScript. I mean, uh, Oracle claims they have a, a trademark on it, and um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, for now, uh, ECMA has the trademark on ECMAScript, so as long as, uh, as long as JavaScript has been standardized, it was always the ECMAScript standard. And I think it's a, a fair reminder that ECMA has a constructive role in, in JavaScript. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, another uh, Shaning-inspired question. What suggestions do you have as to what kind of things I should write as a polyfill with WebAssembly and use them in JS? Uh, yeah, I, I, I promise I didn't plant any questions. I, um, I really didn't. Um, but yeah, uh, 
uh, I think that that's you know some of these heavier library uh, features that we're adding, like you know Intel Segmenter, you know, was sort of like the perfect example for where you know WebAssembly makes makes a lot of sense, right? Um, because you know it's it's very data heavy uh, of of an algorithm uh, to implement. Um, I think that you know some of these other uh, libraries that we're adding, maybe perhaps duration formats um, is another one we're adding. I think message formats is one that 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 could be compelling. Um, to have implemented it in IC for X. I think that, you know, there's also some counterexamples. Like, I think probably signals probably make sense to have a JavaScript direct uh, implementation. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's, you know, a one size fits all solution here. You know, the purpose of my presentation was to show that, like, look, this is a thing that I think that people haven't done enough on the web platform, which is really try to, you know, integrate ec 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 ECMAScript and WebAssembly together because they really can work together in harmony. And I think that's something that people haven't done enough of. And I'm just sort of showing an example for, like, how this actually can get the job done um, when, it may when it's the right tool for the job. Actually, with the WebAssembly GC support, I think uh, WebAssembly would be a great way to implement signals and would encourage anyone who wants to contribute a signal polyfill in WebAssembly. Uh, I want to emphasize part of what, what Shane said. ICU for X is looking for an implementation of message format. If you want to learn Rust and WebAssembly, uh, this would be a great project to get started on. There, there are many strong, uh, you know, they're very good at mentoring people and, and supporting efforts like this. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, a question around task groups. What determines uh, when and what task groups are created? For example, uh, why was a task group created for so uh, source maps? Uh, so I worked on creating the source maps task group with John Cooperman here. John, please stand up and wait. Uh, kind of co convening the group. And uh, all it takes is the committee TC39 to agree yes, we want to start a task group, and then there's the task group. And for source maps, we decided to create a separate group because we thought that uh, it is just a separate thread of investigation. So TG4 for source maps works a little bit differently from TG2 in that we're d doing our development completely separately, and then we're working on bringing the final result to, um, to TC39 plenary. TG2, which uh, I worked on setting up some years ago before Shane took over, uh, is, you know, with, with this model of working on something and then proposing it to TC39, I think both, both models work well. And ultimately, task groups can allow TC39 to scale its behavior to more projects than would be capable of doing if everything had to happen in plenary. I heard that JavaScript developers kept getting lost. So we thought, we'll give them a map to find their source. <laughs> uh, moving on. Yeah, uh, that's why we convened TG4, yes. Uh, but it, by the way, it's also possible and, and quite common that we work in what you could consider ad hoc groups. They're just people who get together and talk about things. And most of the meetings on that calendar were ad hoc meetings rather than task groups. Task groups are more appropriate if you have sort of a long-standing program of work that you're going to continue uh, among a set of people. What, okay, um, so uh, a question about our pr uh, process in general. Um, what is the average time it takes for a proposal to pass all the stages? I think there's no good answer to that. I, I think, you know, they're all over the place. It really depends on the proposal and the kind of, uh, you know, the, the cast that it brings together to sort of, uh, you know, be focused on. There are certain proposals that have been small to like medium size and have like really blazed through. Uh, there's many reasons for that. It could be that it's quite straightforward what the problem space is and what the solution needs to be. And other times there's proposals like Temporo or decorators, which are, you know, quite complex problem spaces and it's difficult for us to get, like, clarity on how exactly it should be defined. Maybe there's, um, you know, not a whole lot of agreement among the committee and then we have to work on building that kind of consensus from the ground up. So I think it really depends on the proposal and there's no like generalized answer that I can give. 
just yeah. to give an idea, though, because, so that we can work with like concrete numbers. Yeah, the the, the smallest possible proposals with, with like a very direct, uh, very obvious um, solution space is you know pr probably six months at the fastest. Whereas um, you know the, the longest proposals we work on, um, I mean, I've I've only been with committee ten years, so I, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure how long they could possibly last, but um, you know, maybe like, like seven years or so. Uh, so, uh, but but you know, your medium-sized proposal, you're probably looking at like two to three years uh, through the whole process from beginning to end. Yeah, and the the reason it's so hard to characterize the answer is because it's not like you submit a proposal and then a timer starts and then it becomes a standard. It all depends on, first, whether it's actually a good idea that we can have consensus on. So imagining it as a timer implies that it will eventually happen, but maybe we, maybe we shouldn't do it. Or maybe the people in the group who, who started the proposal uh, are busy with other things and they don't bring it back to, to committee uh, until someone else comes and picks it up or until they find time again. There, there are all sorts of reasons for uh, things taking different amounts of time. For, for example, we're considering decimal in TC39 now, and that was under consideration uh, at the beginning of this century. It was, or it was considered for ES4 or even earlier than that, and uh, we're, we're still considering it. So there's no, there's no time limit. We're not saying no to decimal just because it's been taking a while, but it also wasn't even under continuous development. All right, and on that subject of things that may not happen, uh, uh, we have a question. What happens when some browsers decide not to implement a feature? Uh, well, usually before a, a feature would even get to stage three, uh, which is the kind of stage at which you start expecting them to implement it, they have a lot of different areas, a lot of different venues to voice their concerns. I, I think we, the fact that we work very closely with our colleagues in different browser teams makes it kind of impossible. I mean, hypothetically it's possible, but we work very closely with them to address their concerns. And even within stage three, we reserve this, like we were talking about what happened with Tempro with us simplifying the proposal a bit. We reserve the ability to improve on proposals during stage three as well, listening to their concerns. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, no kind of, uh, it, the process avoids this from ever happening. Right, I, I think we have a good flow these days where if browsers are not interested in eventually implementing it, then they won't agree to stage three. Um, that is, that is the ideal path and, and way of, of working together, and I think we've been uh, delivering on that recently. One, one of the things that we started doing more recently is looking through our past proposals that are, that are at stage three or two or one, and seeing, checking in on where they are. Um, there's maybe one stage three proposal that hasn't uh, yet gotten much interest from from browsers, and so we'll eventually be reconsidering, should it still be at stage three? Is that an accurate way to, to consider its status? Uh, but we take these decisions uh, slowly and, and carefully, and it would be an exceptional case. All right, so I think we're nearly ready to wrap up. Maybe one last question. Uh, I think this is uh, provoked by your talk, Dan. Um, and the question is, is the signal reactive model always more efficient than the virtual DOM? Or are there trade-offs? Uh, there, there may be trade-offs. Uh, in particular, when running the code for the first time, you have to do this auto-tracking and construct the signal graph. So traditionally, people have said, ah, that, that takes too long, and virtual DOM should have a faster initial render. However, these days, people are thinking more in terms of SSR, where you have, uh, you know, it initially ships HTML, then it hydrates, or maybe it's resumability, but um, I think that's incremental hydration. So the, ultimately, the initial render should be handled by something like that, and hydration techniques have been developed for both 
uh, signal-based systems and VDOM-based systems. Um, there's, so, so in general, there is cost to computed nodes and, and their caching. And sometimes it does make sense to recompute more things. Uh, this this trade-off exists in, in React as well, with the React compiler now making certain decisions about which things to memoize and which things to not memoize. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's subtle, but I, I still am optimistic that signal-based rendering is a good uh, way to, to go about things. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Yeah. And I'll and, and I'll say uh, thank you to our panelists here, uh, Dan, Shane, Urswell, and Michael. <laughs>